Good morning, and thank you for listening to K Talk Radio. This is PrepperCon Radio. We're wearing headphones. It sounds weird. It's amazing. Try that again, right, Shane. How, am I sound good? There, that sounds better. Woo-hoo! That sounds good. Yeah. All right. Well, you are live on K Talk, and so am I. And all the things we'll do for our sponsors, right? We will. We will do lots of crazy <laughs> things. We got a fun show today, as usual. We are brought to you by our good friends over at Survival Medical, the only first aid kit designed for long-term storage. You can find out more at survival-medical.com. Shane, what are we wearing today? We are wearing uh, Tyvek suits. Ask us why we're wearing Tyvek suits. <laughs> Who are you talking to, me? Oh, that's good. Who am I ask talking myself, to? Ask myself. Uh, ask you and I. No, callers, call and ask us, why are we wearing Tyvek suits? <laughs> It's kind of a sensitive, That's what I'm talking to. sensitive topic today. Um, we're, we're having some fun today. We're wearing uh, these awesome Tyvek suits. They come, it's a hooded containment suit. Um, we got them out of our cover-up kits provided by Survival Medical. We've got a pair of nitrile gloves, actually two pairs. We've got an N95 respirator, a, vented, a set of vented safety goggles, and a cloth tape roll. So we can actually get rid of all the seams. you got to put the hood on there, Scott. So I'm not done yet. <laughs> So if you're if you're able to listen in, um, great. If you want to watch next week, please do so. <laughs> when we get this thing loaded live uh, on, on air, it'll be kind of funny to see that we are in here looking like Stay Puft Marshmallow Man. Yes, I know, I've worn these more often than I care to you know, I, to say. Mine's a little snug. I got an, an XL. I should or a two XL. I probably should have got. Okay, a so mine's XL. a large. Mine fits pretty good. Yeah, mine is pretty good. My, my fit problems. Are I might want an XL if I have like a coat on or something underneath yeah. it. Or but this is fun. So, uh, <laughs> J- JR, if you're listening, you, you need to watch this later because it's pretty awesome. So, PrepperCon Radio, we are here to help you get prepared, help dispel, dispel some of the myths, some of the things that you hear a lot that make you worry. Um, we want to help you have hope, not faith. We want to help you have a plan and not panic. Um, and we have a fun show today. We're going to be talking sanitation, um, but we're also going to be talking about a cool new product that just came out that has nothing to do with sanitation, yep, everything yep. to do with just badassery. Yeah. It's awesome. Yeah, yep. um, we've got our good friend who I've known him about, oh, man, it's almost going on two Couple years. years. Yep. Um, Tim Ralston. Yes. One of the Doomsday original, Preppers. Original the Doomsday originals. Preppers, right? He's, he's such a stud. I'm just going to bring him on the line. Do it. Do it. Oh, wrong button here. Tim, are you there? I'm here. Woohoo! Welcome to PrepperCon Radio. We're so excited to have you on air today. Yeah, thanks for coming on Thank with us. Thank you. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Uh, though that intro made me feel really ancient, old. I'm getting a little gray <laughs> in my beard, but really. Well, like okay, the so that's father of prepping, right? <laughs> Why do they call you the grandfather? I just have one of the original. You're like the godfather of doomsday there we preppers. Go. There we go. Like the the TV show. Now, there's been doomsday preppers far far longer than we've all been alive, but you're like the guy when it comes to doomsday preppers, celebrity gear. Like you've you've innovated some of the coolest gear out there. Um, Thank you. Starting off with well, probably didn't start off with the Kroval, but was that your first big? <coughs> yeah, that's actually the, that what kicked everything off is the Kroval. That's why they came to me. And I'm like, well, yeah, I won't do the show and give up everything unless I can at least talk talk about the new invention. And they, they agreed to that, which was fantastic. And so, uh, yeah, that's what kicked it all off. But, you know, you're only as good as your last invention you know, for me. And you know, what I used to do before I did all this, it's just all about marketing and bringing new products, but it wasn't survival products. That's just my passion and love. So I would take everything from leather cleaners on up, uh, pencil sharpeners out to the market and get people to, you know, like them, love them, and buy them. And I'm like, why should I do it for everybody else? Why not do stuff I want and things that matter to me? And that's about being prepared. So it's uh, it spurred on a whole new focus and venture for me. And uh, now I'm definitely on a brand new path. So you guys are are getting the new, innovative, brand new Tim Ralston for sure. <laughs> very, um, very. Had cool. to reinvent myself. For or sure. as we found out on Facebook, we're going to have to call you Ridge Ralston till till that gets fixed. Oh, I know. My whole thing got hijacked. My Facebook got hijacked, and uh, so consequently, um, the, my son was 
put in there in its place, and Facebook will not let you change your name back for 60 days. Yes, 60 oh, days? I thought it was days. six months. I, that happened to me, too, uh, as I well. I can't stand it. So. Though I love the name Ridge. It's my son's name. You yeah. know, so I love that name, but now everyone thinks it's uh, Ridge and not Tim, and so it's, it's a bit confusing, especially with new vendors, um, which mm-hmm. I'm beginning calls all the time for new people wanting this new product so yeah. that's all that's all good i bet so i'm curious obviously you created the crovel before Crovel. doomsday preppers crovel excuse yeah. me crowbar oh, shovel crowbar Crovel. shovel crovel before doomsday so what got you into prepping how long you've been do you, have you considered yourself a prepper i mean what was your kind of your genesis of that yeah you know um back back when uh you know nat geo kept coming to me and asking okay so what is prepping and what is survivalist and i'm like Okay, I know the word survivalist. I get it. Mm-hmm. You know, you have connotations of that that guy with the big beard, long hair, counting his beans and weenies up in the mountains yeah, and yeah. hoarding it all. Yeah. And I'm like, well, I'm not that guy. And uh, prepping, I said that before it was even coined a phrase. And I just said, well, I'm kind of that soccer dad that's got a little bit more on the ball just when it comes to just in case. And I started that. It's really just a way of life for me i grew up on a ranch in colorado and you know my grandparents were very self-sufficient pioneer kind of people you know they literally got up at four in the morning to work the farm then go in work their own company um for 50 years they did that kind of routine then after work come home and take care of the the farm again and um, as a kid every weekend i would go out and help you know work the farm the crops the butchering the chickens and yada 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 and so that's just kind of a, a way of life back then it's just called living and now it's called prepping, called prepping and, yeah yeah <laughs> so uh, you know as far back as i can remember it, it's been just what i used to do and when i got out into the military world you know they t- taught me how to show up on time is basically all i learned from the military a few other things but for the most part it's discipline and focus and being very organized and you know prepare for the worst and hope for the best and that's always been the mantra that I've been that I've lived by but you know I think it really kicked up a couple notches when I got uh, thrown a, a 7.4 pound baby boy mm-hmm. and I was like oh that's a that's a game changer right there so at that point prepping the word prepping got a lot more serious because then you know I can live on just about nothing and and yeah. and make do but not that little guy you know he has certain requirements that i'm like well geez if something drew you know dried up you know supply chain or whatever what am i going to do about his needs and uh, he's definitely going to be screaming at me wanting to be taken care of so yeah, i, that, I started definitely. prepping a lot harder when i had kids and uh it made it a lot more serious for me and uh you know about that time you know the whole y2k thing came in and um, you know, just on down the line, one little thing after another, and, and then 9-11 hit. And so prepping for me just got a lot more serious. And, and at that point, it, it's about looking at data coming in, you know, that normalcy bias bubble that we all have. Yep. You know, oh, nothing will happen to me, and it'll happen to the other guy in the other country. And, and your head's in the sand, and all you do is go to work and come home, and, and you don't worry or plan for anything. But once I started to look outside the normal mainstream media, which doesn't tell you anything, yep. you have to go to alternative, you know, uh, data uh, points like your guys' show and and uh, the internet. That will start to kind of lift the veil of what's potential out there, the threat level. And for me, it's I base my preps on whatever threat level I'm looking at, and then you know you just back up, and keep looking. It's just all about the information. And once you get it, then you just go, okay, well, um, things are a little more dicey this next month. I'll, I'll prep up a little harder. But, you know, I always prepare for the worst, worst case scenario. And then once I'm ready for that, anything else, you know, whether it's a snowstorm or a hiccup, you know, you lose your job or whatever, it's not a problem. You can just breeze through it because you're prepared for something way worse than that. Absolutely. I think it's, it's interesting, your story and my story, although I don't have any kids, it's, it's pretty similar. You know, I was always into prepping, um, but I didn't call it that. And actually, until I started moving, until I moved to Arizona, 
I didn't really call it prepping. I yeah, just well, was like, like Tim said, you just call it life. Yeah, just, hey, okay, I've always got my 72-hour kit. Cool. And that actually turned into a 96-hour kit for two that I, I kind of felt like it wasn't enough and it wasn't yeah. customized for me. I actually bought my first one out of, out of a out of a store catalog and I was like, oh yeah, perfect. Okay. It's got this, it's got mm-hmm. this. And I threw out <laughs> half the stuff in it within a year. I'm like, this is junk. This is junk. I'm going to get this. I want to get this. And, and it's funny because when I got married, I went hyper focused. I was like, holy crap, holy crap. I've got another person I'm responsible for. I've got to make sure I've got more stuff. Cause I had always a three to six month supply of food. You know, I always had an extra first aid kit in every vehicle and in my house, everywhere I went, I had stuff and I was always checking it every six months. I'd check all my stuff, make sure everything was, was good and usable, or if it was close to its breaking point, replace it. And as soon as I got married, I was like, Oh, I I don't have enough. Cause all of a sudden my, my food supply went cut in half, you know, you had one Mm -hmm. person and, uh, then my, all my strategies for survival changed as well, because now I've got to think of the needs of my wife you know and Shane's probably the same way I mean you've got five. kids coming out of the wazoo <laughs> he's got five, five kids and they're all over the charts as far as where they are in their lives yeah. I mean 21 to 4 tw- holy oh, yeah. yeah, yeah all, all over the range really and, and you know, like, like you're saying Tim is, is you know you prepare for the, for the worst hope for the best and then as you monitor the news the alternative media <laughs> in particular you make your slight tweaks and adjustments. And it's, okay, well, this month I'm going to focus on getting uh, maybe a little more silver, or this month I'm going to focus on doing this a little bit better, and I'm going to learn about this uh, and practice this skill this month, and yeah. and just mm-hmm. tweak it. And 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 like you say, it's it's the way it life used to be. Yeah, exactly. It's it's, it's self sufficiency, and uh, we lost so much of that. You know, if and I always people always ask, what's the worst? What's the worst? And uh, and I always said, well, obviously an EMP attack would be the worst case scenario that it would ever happen because we're so dependent on on uh, power and you know, living without it would be really, really difficult for just everybody, not mm-hmm. just a few people, but everybody. Oh, yeah. And so um, I, I look at those scenarios and go, okay, well, what if? And then you try to play that. But like you said, the practice is the best thing. I, I actually did a little practicing uh, last week. I went up to Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Yeah, I saw your videos. To, to do some fun stuff out in the woods. And, uh, yeah, I came back learning a lot. I, I learned that my tool was badass, and it was doing well, and it, <laughs> it, it held up so much better than I did. And now I, like, evaluated, okay, what's, what's the weak chain here in this, uh, in my, uh, my bug out plan and it was like it's me my shape i gotta mm-hmm. get in better shape <laughs> so, so yeah what you're talking about is your new tool called the timahawk yeah. and we're coming up on a break here real quick and and uh tell us about that briefly sure well you know the timahawk is you know i've i've been playing around with a lot of different edge weapons and, and tools and i of course i'm really push hard on multi-use it's got to have more than just one use and so I came up with the Timahawk is basically a hybrid of what the Kroval is what the Nax is and uh, another big bearded axe mm-hmm. when I started doing a lot of research every outdoors backwoodsman you know their number one go to tool is an axe yeah. but yep. you know an axe can only do so much and so I looked at it and there's always a weak point and that's the handle and always breaks eventually but yes you can carve another one but I don't like my tools breaking I, I make yep. things really really hardcore so, we're so gonna, I can buy we're going to jump off of this for a second got to go to our commercial break um, when we get back let's keep talking about this because it's, it's a great design we'll be right back after a few messages from our sponsors the Obamacare penalty of over 2000 <laughs> Hey, we're back. You're listening to K Talk Radio, AM 630. You can uh, actually find us on k talk.com. Download the app, listen anywhere in the world. Uh, you're also listening if you're on the airwaves, AM 630, pretty much all over Utah and southern Idaho. We've actually got quite a, quite a reach. This hour sponsored, as usual, by Survival Medical, the only first aid kit designed for long-term storage. Check them out over at survival-medical.com, and you can find them next month in Sam's Club. And right now we are wearing the cover-up kit, which is a contamination protection kit. And the reason we're wearing this uh, today is because we're talking, uh, going to be talking about sanitation here shortly. We're going to finish up uh, talking with him about uh, his cool stuff, and then we're going to get him to, to chime in with us on uh, 
what to do about sanitation in uh, the SHTF, in, uh, in the, the doomsday scenario, right? Right. Exactly. Okay, so you were talking, before we had to cut you off, you are talking about one of the problems is having to replace handles on your tools. You're tired of those breaking. You're tired of tools breaking. Um, and so with the Timahawk, that's a full tang tool, right? It's a full tang, yeah, all the way through, so you're never going to make it break at all um so if you miss hit it which i did in one of my demos the very first swing i took i miss hit where normally that could have knocked the entire head right off and it just powered right through it so <clears throat> and it's balanced still really well for throwing um again in, in a fight i wouldn't recommend throwing your tool but yeah. i had no problem sticking that thing every single time which was a lot of fun plus when it hit the the tim hawk weighs about for just under four pounds, which was one of my goals. Is I, I wanted it to be under the, the weight of the, one of the East Wind um, axes, one of my mm-hmm. favorite ones. Mm-hmm. Um, so I wanted it to, to weigh about that same because that one I actually carried with me. You know, it's all pounds equal pain, and yeah. I'm not going to carry something that weighs, so, it weighs me down to where I don't want to carry it. Um, <clears throat> and, again, it's got to be able to do more than – just cut wood and process wood so with this product and your viewers can't really see it so i can describe it it's got a really heavy beard um, which is really just this very long kind of viking look um, to it i wanted it to look like it's scary you know and i'm i'm uh, actually got some viking blood in me somewhere and so i'm like (laughs) it kind of came out in the design but um, i also wanted to use the ads um, because i've used that in the past for a lot of other things um, other than just chipping away wood it becomes a really great digger because I had to be able to reduce my weight so I I needed to find the ability to still dig and this thing definitely did a number uh, especially when I was up in in, uh, Idaho because digging through the clay and all the roots every time you would chop you know with a regular shovel you've got big roots and to cut through with a shovel the ads would probably do a good job yeah this thing just goes right through it. So it worked out really well. And then it's got, of course, all my tools have a crowbar on it. So the back end of it, it's got a crowbar for jamming and getting in and out of places. So mm-hmm. One of the most use- useful tools to have just anywhere you go is a crowbar. Yep. I. It's so funny how often people forget about that. We actually had uh, Julie Harmon, Ms. America. She actually spoke at PrepperCon talking about how her sister, when they were in uh, in Japan – that big earthquake mm-hmm. the only thing they had was, crowbar. was a crowbar yep. um, and that was the thing they needed more than anything else to get their documents their papers so they could actually leave the country because they couldn't leave without their passports and everything and the only way to get to it was to use the crowbar to break into the closet and then break open the safe that it was in so this is awesome because it's a, it's an all-in-one type of tool i shouldn't say all yep. in one but many in one type of tool so you've got that you've got the axe it's it's a self defense tool as well, and if oh yeah, if it's, I want to go win a, a mountain man rendezvous competition in tomahawk throwing, I could hurl this <laughs> thing at a at a tree pretty well. Oh, you definitely could. It would probably split the tree if it if you hit it just right. Yeah. Sweet. Now my my thought is I I like to see different versions. Or you th- have you thought of maybe doing a smaller hatchet type version? Actually, um, there's two others that are on the drawing board already. Cool. Um, again. You're only as good as your last invention. So I'm going to make an entire Timahawk line. Very nice. Uh, one's going to be a smaller one, and the other one I'm going to partner with a fantastic saw company, Silky Saws, mm. is who I'm going after because I literally think they have the best saw on the market. <clears throat> so what I want to do is incorporate a 18-inch saw, one of their best saws mm-hmm. for processing wood, and incorporate it into the handle Very nice. where it – flips out like a um, like a switchblade mm-hmm. yeah um, so now you would have not only the axe but you have the saw for um, processing wood but I've, I'm actually going to be putting a kit together um, I had a custom carry sling carry um, a scabbard um, designed for the Timahawk yeah I saw that. where it has a, a lot of uh, outside uh, pockets and then of course if you want to I'll I'll put in everything that I would do I mean on my unit, I have, you know, there's certain elements that you have to have for survival. You know, you, you're the 5C rule, and I put some things that, you know, I've tried in, in 
are true to me, and I put those in the kit as well. So when it's all said and done, this um, this scavenger will be filled with everything that you would need to survive if you nice. got thrown into any environment, this whether is- it's urban or jungle or mountain. You'd be have a, you'd have enough of the elements to be able to you know make it through is. You know, as long as your wits and skills could can take you at least. Stick with you, yeah. Very we cool. actually have a caller that wants to talk. Uh, this is Falcon. We're going to bring Falcon on the line. He wants to ask a question about bugging out. Falcon, are you there? I am. I've been waiting for the perfect show to ask this question. I think this is it. <laughs> well, we're glad to have you. What's your question for us? So um, I've been a prepper for, oh, I don't know, and not an extreme prepper at all, just like mm-hmm. the basics. Um, you know, I figured if I could go two years on food, uh, that's way more than the society could handle if we didn't have food for two years. And right. I recently sold off my old food, so now I'm like got about one year. Um, and so I'm 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 practical in that way, but not extreme in any other way. So I'm talking to my neighbor who uh, believes in doomsday, and he he said um, that he's you know, planning on going up to the hills. But as he's older and his wife can barely walk. And I'm thinking, I'm looking at him thinking, dude, you're not going to survive in the mountains, mm-hmm. particularly in the winter. So my attitude is I'm not going anywhere. I, I'm setting myself up where I'm at. If something happens, I'm just hunkering down where I'm at, where I'm at. I'm not bugging out. Uh, but, and, and I wanted to, to ask you about that what do you think about that in, in regards to also i do have neighbors i do have neighbors and a lot of people aren't prepared mm-hmm. H- how do you guys foresee the future if there was a need to to survive without the system uh, in place with a lot of people who aren't prepared um you know i don't really know how to handle that scenario to be honest with you well that's a great question i could definitely answer but let's let tim give his response <clears throat> all right that's it that's a great, um, a great one, Falcon. Let me tell you, um, because I've already gone through those scenarios myself with my fallout uh, shelter. I had, you know, it's it's tough when you have neighbors around you that are not as prepared as you, but then there are other neighbors that are more prepared than you, and then you've got to kind of weigh that out. I mean, I don't think that there's that lone wolf scenario. That's not what prepping is all about. That's prepping to me is about getting communities together because you have to have a rebuild of society because it's all going to if it does crumble you know there's got to be good groups of people that help to rebuild it and that have to protect each other because you can't do it you know by yourself so educating your other neighbors in a really soft way um, is is a better way to assure your survival in the long term Um, again going and bugging out i think it's still got to be in your plan i mean there's still got to be a cachet that you personally, if it got to that bad, bad point where, okay, I've got to go, you have to have at least the foresight and planning to be able to say, if it's just me and my family and we do have to go lone wolf by ourselves, at least you're not out in the, uh, in the elements with nothing. So I always have that backup plan to the backup plan. But staying in put and, and, and hunkering down, to me, it's always the best thought, um, simply because if you know, you take half the people out there and say, here, let's do a test and say, especially here in Arizona. I mean, I have hear this all the time. Oh, I'm going to go out in the woods and survive. And I'm like, I'll guarantee you, you couldn't last two days. Number one, you won't find the water. And then number two, there was no game. There's no food. You know, oh, there's the mountains. There'll be plenty of food. And I go, well, there's another million people like you that are going to be up there hunting that only one Bambi that's running for their lives. And then how do you process it? How do you store the meat? How do you preserve it? Not a lot of people have those skills. So, you know, living off the land is not as an uh, effective plan as going, all right, well, I'm going to go buy two bunnies and a buck and produce my own food and not have to go out there in the elements and, and risk my life. I'd rather, you know, raise bunnies in the basement. And, uh, you know, that just to me is a lot better plan uh, than going out and saying, I'm going to live off the land. Um, I haven't had any place yet, other than when I went to Coeur d'Alene, I've never seen so much wildlife in my life. It was insane. I'm like, maybe I could make it here uh, living off the land just because of the abundance of life, But and there's less people there. But everywhere else, I think, is, is 
going to be a, a tough scenario. So I think it's plan for that worst case scenario for bugging out only at the last ditch, but get those neighbors uh, on your side because you know the older people, like you said, that are not going to have the ability, but they still have um, the ability to maybe buy supplies and and help in any way they can. Um, I have a couple friends like that that you know don't have a lot of skills, but they have a lot of money, and so that is kind of offsetting their their lack of being able to do things, fight, hunt, do that stuff, but at least they can purchase a lot of extra supplies and get a plan together. Um, and I think that is my best case scenario um, right now. I think Tim nailed it on the head. It's, it's all about community. And if you can get a community around you and everyone's doing similar things, you're going to find so many skill sets that complement mm-hmm. each other that that's going to give you a better chance for getting through it and rebuilding. Because the idea is, yes, say there's a collapse, say there's an EMP, say whatever the scenario is, say it is a zombie apocalypse, you know, you're not going to do well alone. Lone wolf never works. Um, Surviving in the woods, you're competing with thousands and thousands of other people trying to do the same thing that don't know what they're doing, so they're either scaring off all the game or shooting people accidentally. So you want to make sure that whatever your plan is, that you've got contingencies, but most importantly that you've got a team, you've got a group that you're working with, and I think community is the way to go because you're going to have to rebuild when you're done. And maybe you don't know how to rebuild on your own, but somebody else knows how to do sanitation. Somebody else knows how to do construction. You might know how to do you know, communications, get a ham system set up, or find a way to, to get the, the group together or organize. Um, or you may be fantastic at a line item cook and you can get food going for the whole group. Everyone's got different skill sets, and I think Tim hit it right on the head. You've got to have that community, and you can start helping that community. That's actually why we started doing the radio show, why we started doing PrepperCon, is to help the community actually expand their reach and preparedness and helping each other because the only thing we can do is to get more people on board. And when we do that, we have a greater success rate when something does happen. Um, Could I ask ask another question? Sure, go ahead. (coughs) Okay. Um, it's actually a two-part question. One is about chickens. I've, I've thought about getting chickens for a while. Um, I don't know if it would be worth it, but it seems like a great thing to have in that situation because they're producing eggs, and that's really a great food to have. Um, also, I have a, a cat that spends the entire summer chasing crickets in the backyard. We have tons of crickets, and she just catches them and just eats them whole, and she is so healthy and has mm-hmm. so much energy, and she just gobbles them up every day. That's her big thing. Get out of the house in the morning and get crickets. So this is this other part of the question is about the survival. Um, I've always wanted to learn edible plants and sort of surviving on the land. Is it not a practical <laughs> thing, uh, or is it to, to know how to find these certain plants? And, and it, could you really... Could you survive if you had that skill on edible plants? Is it, is it a practical thing? I'll take this real quick. Um, and, Tim, if you want to chime in as well. Uh, mm-hmm. Chickens, I think, are fantastic. Um, and that's my plan. The way we're going, to, going is eggs, chicken, meat, so forth. Uh, and plus, you know, they'll have plenty of crickets to eat as well at your place, it sounds like. Uh, as for edible plants and l- learning to, to live off the wild, absolutely. I think that is a fantastic plan to learn that you need to have that knowledge and that skill set. However, uh, in the short term, uh, I think you should lean toward your food storage. In the long term, that will, I believe, become very uh, important knowledge in the long term after your one year of food storage, two years of food storage runs out. Of course, you need to learn gardening and all that stuff as well. But there is no reason you should not learn about the native local plants and what you can eat, what you can't eat, and so forth. I, I think that's uh, absolutely, I would, I would spend time on that. It's definitely worthwhile cost. Yeah, I, I totally agree. It's it's once you lose once you lose all the really cool tools and your food storage runs out, you've got to rely on those primitive living skills. So I I always advocate you know practice when it's not your life in jeopardy. You know get those skill sets under your belt. That that get, as a prepper that gives you that. Uh, all right, I've got this. I can start a fire without a match. I can do this. I can build a shelter. I can get all these primitive things if it really hit the fan and i had nothing 
I'm still at least in the fight. Absolutely. And um, you know, for me, uh, I'm on I'm the same line as you guys. Uh, definitely chickens. Um, for me, I'm also looking at uh, a small goat, uh, milk goat, and for the cheeses. And then um, for me, bunny rabbits are a huge part of it. I love uh, two, bunny two, rabbits. Two, two, yeah, two, two, uh, uh, two doe and a buck can produce about 370 pounds worth of meat. Um, and the beautiful thing about that um, versus cattle and everything else, they don't eat a lot. They're very quiet. They're relatively clean and um, it, uh, you can eat them in one sitting. So it's not like you have to worry about um, storing the excess, you know, food. Plus, you've got that fur um, that you can process into, you know, blankets and clothing if you need to. So it's just such a perfect little food source um, for me right there. And uh, and weird. the crickets, um, I've been pushing. You know, I do little tests with my kids. We have scorpions here, and uh, we'll catch. You know, because. I mean, go to China for, for a week and you'll see what you eat over there. Um, but uh, cricket, that's a delicacy, you know, a little deep fried, some salt and pepper. You'd be amazed how good those things taste. They're like little popcorn. So, Absolutely. Oh, I'm going to, I'll leave you, guys, I'm going to leave you with one last question and I'll ring off, but I want to thank all of you for, for the show today and for answering my questions. And this, this show is, in my mind, this is a premium show. I mean, this is really great show that you guys do. Thanks, so thanks. We've got about five seconds before Appreciate it cuts it. us off. Uh, yeah, do you, do you not name the rabbits? It's just harder <laughs> to eat them. <laughs> They're no, too cute for me. I name mine lunch and dinner, and that's all I do. <laughs> hey, we're running to a commercial break. Thanks this for, hour is brought to you by Survival Medical. We want to thank them. Um, we'll be back after the break. Check them out, survival-medical.com. Hey, welcome back to PrepperCon Radio on AM 630 K-Talk. We are brought to you by our just phenomenal friends over at Survival Medical. Again, they're the only first aid kit designed for long-term storage. But it's not just first aid kits. They've got sanitation. They've, they've got these these wonderful cover-up kits that we're wearing and we're having a lot of fun with today. Love you, John. Um, John is <laughs> John's a good old boy from Missouri, but he is brilliant. Yep. He is he is a genius when it comes to medical gear. Um, they all everything they sell is actually vacuum sealed and stores up to twenty years. And you'll be able to find them in uh, Sam's Club starting in July, I believe. Yes, locally here in Utah. Yep. But if you're not near a Sam's Club or if you want your stuff now, it's actually the best pricing that I've ever seen when it comes to first aid. Uh, go to survival-medical.com. Um, right now, I want to switch gears. Let's talk sanitation. We've talked a little bit of bugging out. We've talked a little bit about the awesome implements that Tim creates. Um, but one of the things we really wanted to talk about today is, is sanitation. And according to the Red Cross, globally, each year, roughly the equivalent of an entire population of, of Melbourne, Australia, mm-hmm. which is 4 million people, is wiped out by diseases linked to either lack of safe drinking water, inadequate sanitation, or poor hygiene. And this is ma- further magnified in a during during times of trouble, disaster, war. Uh, one of the myths I wanted to talk about last week was that most likely in a in a, an SHTF scenario, you're going to be killed by a bullet. That's not the case. You're going to be killed by dysentery. You're going to be killed by uh, cholera, some kind of sickness. Uh, so that's where we really wanted to focus on, on the sanitation today uh, about, okay, how are we going to do this when you don't have running water, when you don't have uh, grid power? Uh, it's a terribly important topic that is also terribly neglected. Absolutely. I think it's one of the most neglected things in preparedness. Everyone talks about their cool plan. Mm -hmm. Oh, we're bugging out. We're going here. I'm like, okay, where's your latrine when you get there? Yeah. Oh, well, we'll just dig one by the camp. You're going to carry all your hand soap with you? You Yeah. You make hand soap out of it. Lie. You're going to (laughs) use the ashes from your fire, and you're going to create your own hand soap and get the fats from the animals that you kill. (laughs) Exactly. Tim, what are are your thoughts on this? When it comes to sanitation, what's, what's your plan? That's, uh, well, you know, that's a, a great question. And uh, there's a, a couple of products that I've run into that um, that, I've, uh, that I've bought a lot of and, and have extra long storage for these guys. It, it's called Soldier Soap. It's pretty interesting. Uh, soldier it's, Soap? It's a Soldier Soap, yeah. Oh, yeah, Soldier Soap, a, okay. Yeah, it's, it's an older recipe uh, that's been kind of been brought back and, 
It has it's all natural uh, in ing- ingredients in it, and uh, it actually helps to kill bacteria, and it smells not too crazy perfumey. It smells more natural, so you're not giving yourself away with smelling like mm-hmm. a, uh, a pharmacy. But, you know, for me, I, I agree with you, it, you know, having the way to filter water um, and to, to, I mean, water is the, the number one thing, yeah. to be able to get good drinking water. I actually have a new invention that will be coming out probably in the fall that will um, address this issue, which is pretty cool. It's a forever filter, but I won't say any more. Cool. And uh, uh, it's very, yeah. <laughs> spoiler yeah. alert. No we'll more spoiler. Spoiler alert. Very cool. <laughs> but uh, n- nevertheless, you know, for me, the, the one little product that I have, a gazillion of buckets full, are wipey wipes. Mm-hmm, and I mm-hmm. tell you, those suckers, I, I can't, I can't even tell as far as prepping. It, you know, I tell people, paper plates, wipey wipes, all that's what you're going to need. I mean, you're not going to use your water to wash your dishes. You're not going to, you know, you're, you're going to want to burn everything that you can and not leave a trace. And again, that helps to keep things uh, from attracting other things, uh, you know, critters and whatnot. So and I mean, wipey wipes. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say, especially uh, you know us, you in Arizona, us in Utah, we're the second and third driest states in the in the nation. So we have to be very mindful about using your water. And and obviously, when you comes to water storage, you're going to keep at least a gallon a day for yourself, and that does yeah. not include your sanitation, your cleaning of your dishes and your laundry and so forth. So you've got to have a lot of water. Like exactly like you're saying, hand wipes, those are excellent tools. There, there are also a lot of other things, we, strategies we can talk about about using less water for. Well, obviously, you've got to have water for sanitation, uh, but what's the best way to use minimal water, the le- least water you can for for washing and cleaning? Uh, we could definitely talk exactly. about those those types of ideas. Uh, using the the bathroom, I mean, uh, that becomes very difficult when you can't flush. Yeah, the two biggest problems yeah. are water and toilets, according to the Red Cross. Okay, and and that goes not just for refugee camps. This goes anytime there's an either an epidemic or a um, emergency like a hurricane or earthquake the first problem is water the second problem is your poop Mm -hmm. right your feces you've got to have that you've got to get rid of that you can't have it in your living area you can't have that you can't use your toilet anymore if the grid's down guys Mm -hmm. unless you're bringing in a gallon of water and flushing it but then guess what that piping system is going to get backed up all the way back into your house eventually Mm -hmm. so you have to create an outhouse a system Mm-hmm. Um, and and that's one of the biggest things the Red Cross has to do is when they go into places they have to remind people okay stop using your bathroom mm-hmm. until services are turned back on you're using all these porta potties we just brought in now something I want to bring up uh, with this issue is both Scott both you and I we live on a hillside so we can continue to use our our uh, either it's a septic system or the public sewer uh, because our all of ours is going to flow downhill now if you live in a low lying area that maybe the sewage has to get pumped out of there you're absolutely right you cannot use your 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 toilets at all you can't put anything down the drains and if other people are using that it may very well flow back into your home yeah our what we had uh, in our cabin situation my neighbor <clears throat> had a backhoe and uh collectively we we worked out a, a solution to that problem because once um my water did go out up at the cabin and uh we were up there just for the weekend and we were like trying to go my kids would still they're in the habit of going to the bathroom and there you mm-hmm. know like, hit the woods be a bear you know yep. live 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 <laughs> yep. live live a little rough and they would forget and to actually get a toilet to flush you use so much water mm-hmm. it's insane but what we did is uh, he took his backhoe out on the very back corner of our property and he dug, I think it was about a 15 foot deep and about eight feet by eight feet hole, put all the dirt off to one side. And uh, then he had a 50 gallon drum of lye next to it. <laughs> and um, so for us, um, I took, I save everything I can. Every big jug of tea, I'll save it because it's a good water vessel and I'll rinse it out and then fill it up. and. There you go. I have that extra. My garage is now getting really full with extra water. But here, you never know. Yeah. But I also save every one of the plastic bags that uh, 
I get from the grocery store every time I go. I save them. And uh, that's instead of going out and buying all the expensive, you know, uh, garbage bags, Mm -hmm. I've got them all for free. And uh, I would be able to use that, tie it up after you go to the restroom, and we dump it into our our hole in the back Mm -hmm. um, with the can of lye. And there you go. That's that was our um, that was our problem solving ability there. Plus, uh, my neighbor was a little bit on that wild side. He's like, yeah, you know, if that trespasser comes, there's that hole, you know, in that worst <laughs> case scenario. And I'm like, yep. that, that scared me a little bit. Uh, I wound up going. Get to know uh, your neighbors. Selling. Uh, yeah, I, I wound up selling the property because of that statement. I was like going. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. And I guess what Tim, Tim is talking about, this lie, is that it, it's used to cut down odors. You can use uh, sawdust, you know, wood chips. You can use um, ashes from your from your fire because obviously you'll be using fire more in a uh, grid-down scenario. Use those to cover up the odors. So you can use that in your house if you choose to use five-gallon buckets. There are a lot of different ways you can go about caring, taking care of your sanitation needs inside your house as well as outside. Absolutely. We actually have another sure. caller. Um, I'm going to bring him on. Jerry, are you there? Hello. All right. Hey, you're on the air with K-Talk. Now, you had a question about another process. What was it you, you referenced? The smear method. At one time, the Forest Service was requiring of backpackers that uh, you use the smear method. You mm-hmm. find a south rock, smear feces on the south-facing rock, ultraviolet light from the sun, yep. dry up, kills the bacteria, and you end up with uh, fertilizer. Yep. Okay. Absolutely. And well, it, there are definitely methods where you can, when, say, you're at home in in the home, and you're 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 using your rest facilities at home, where you can separate the urine the, and the feces and so forth, and then put that outside to where you can, like you say, put it in the sun, and then compost it. So, yeah. If you uh, if you took a piece of like corrugated roof metal mm-hmm. and up against your back fence or somewhere on the back part of your property facing mm-hmm. south. You could use the smear method on that. If you take your urine and pour it around the perimeter... Lovely your... picture in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, if you, if you separate your urine and yep. you pour it around the perimeter of your, of your place, that'll keep out uh, foreign critters. Mm-hmm. And also keep in mind to separate the your toilet paper as well. You can burn that. Uh, it doesn't compost obviously as well as as other things, but it does compost. But and you uh, can get biodegradable yeah. or better biodegradable because mm-hmm. toilet paper is biodegradable, but it takes a long yeah. time. And you'll run out eventually, so you have to come up with other methods of how to t- clean yourself. Yes. Well, on a cost basis method, um, the baby wipes are actually just about as cheap as toilet paper. Mm-hmm. You know? Absolutely. More effective. Fantastic yeah. points. Thanks so much, Jerry. We got Appreciate another caller. People want hey, to Hey, you're uh, you're live on KTAC. What's your name and what's your question? Uh, Larry here. Hey, Larry. Uh, we have a dairy and we killed hoof and hoof and what's it called? Hoof, hoof rot for the mm-hmm. dairy cow with lime. Okay. You know, it's white. We used to get it from the sugar factory over in West Jordan. It's 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 just lime. I guess you, it's in concrete too. I'm not mm-hmm. sure. Yeah. But anyway, that kills in latrines. You can throw some lime, you know, and it kills the smell and kills every everything. You yeah, know? It gets rid of all the bacteria, and that's one of the it's biggest things. We lime, have to get rid of all lime. the bacteria. If we're not killing the bacteria, that's what's going to come back and kill us. Mm-hmm. Well, it kills the bacteria. It kills yeah. everything. Absolutely. And it kills the smell. And that's you know, nice. And yeah. It's called. Just lime, you know. It's, yes. Uh, you know, it's probably from limestone, obviously. Yep, I believe so. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Awesome. No, thanks, thanks so much for your call. Call. Appreciate it. Awesome. So obviously, you know, we we can talk more right. about this topic. There, are, uh, you know, just do some searches online, and you can find out different ways to how to handle how to either dig a latrine, what's called uh, cat holes, uh, dig a small trench. Uh, outside your yard, away from water sources, those types of things. So us in a more urban environment where you've got a small lot, you, it's definitely easier to handle with uh, the the bathroom problems by by doing handling that outside. If you're in an apartment, obviously much more difficult to, to handle that. Um, but there are ho- so many other aspects of sanitation as well that, that we need to talk about. We don't have much time left, but uh, how do you uh, 
how, how do you wash yourself? How do you clean yourself? Tim, do you have what, what's your strategy? Well, again, it just goes back to the wipey wipes for me okay. um, because I'm still kind of in a, uh, a city uh, scenario, um, so I don't have the luxury of being able to, you know, do a, a rain catch and have an outdoor shower that's set aside just for that. I mean, if I had the perfect case scenario, I mean, I could make a, you know, a really nice cleaning uh, you know, outdoor bathroom scenario. But here, I'm I'm landlocked. I'm 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 in the uh, right now in the uh, apartment townhome kind of scenario with exit strategies, and I have to you know adapt and survive what I'm doing. So that's stocking up on the wipey wipes and uh, and the extra baggies, so I know where I can dump them when I need to. And mm -hmm. it's you know that's what prepping is all about. You you got to make do with what you've got, and that's where I where I'm at right now. Make the plan Hopefully now. Hopefully soon. Yeah, Northern Idaho. Here I come. Absolutely. Well, you got to stop Maybe talking about Northern Lake, Idaho though, right? because you, the more you talk about it, the more people are going to know the secrets out, and they're going to all start yeah. heading there yeah. as well. It is a fantastic oh. place. So let's start talking about North Dakota instead. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> That's right. Everybody go to North Dakota. That's the ideal place to prep. I'm actually headed to uh, to Idaho this weekend. We're going to be staying at a, uh, a ranch lodge up by uh, by Ryrie off the Snake River, and I I grew up in Idaho Falls. So I love it's beautiful going up to Idaho and camping and fishing and hiking. Uh, it looks like we're going to have to address this uh, a, a whole nother show as we are out of time. Uh, our music's coming in, and we certainly appreciate you coming on with us, Tim. It's been fantastic. We'll have you on an, for another show. Um, and again, well, this hour is sponsored by Survival Medical, the only first aid kit designed for long-term storage. Find out more at survival-medical.com. Thanks, everybody, for listening. We'll catch you next week. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Tim. Keep on prepping, everybody.